Is it as prolific as I've just suggested? Yes. Right. Is it possible that fighters can dope without anyone knowing? Without anyone else knowing? No. But there was a significant period right before his first world title fight where I had just upped and left. I didn't want to be next to him. In that moment, we hated each other. He's going to have to work his ass off. He's going to have right. to be able to move his feet, his head and his hands simultaneously. It's a, I mean, for Usyk, it's a monumental challenge just because of the size of the challenge of Tyson Fury. So we, we've done the, like, the, the trash talking, big mouth, braggart role. Is this you being honest about how that was? Or is this now you conjuring an image back in retrospect? Go, I've looked at it now and that's a good a story. No. Rather than the reality of no, it, I don't really think was. I've never said this to anyone. This is up front with me, Simon Jordan. I believe there are a lot of vacuous, uninformed, unchallenged opinions out there. I want to get to the bottom line and cut through the nonsense. So, with this podcast with William Hill, I'm going to get people with strong views who think they can stand them up to proper scrutiny. There's a good chance I might learn something along the way, and more importantly, so might you. Joining me in today's episode, one of the country's most recognizable and respected boxing trainers. Synonymous in taking David Hay to cruiserweight and then heavyweight glory, and in Andy Lee lifting aloft the WBO middleweight title, whilst guarding the likes of Josh Kelly, Michael Conlon, and Liam Williams, to name a few along the way. Over two decades of experience and still going strong in the corner, Adam Booth, welcome to Upfront. Thank you. Nice to see you. Um, a lot of these shows recently have been about boxing, because I have a, a real passion for this sport, a real love of it and a real interest and intrigue in it uh, and one of the things that I wanted to do was talk to a trainer because I've spoken to Frank Warren about promotion I've had various discussions with Eddie Hearn in other platforms about his version of promotion and one of the fascinating parts for me is the other part of the equation beyond the fighters is the trainers and the intellectual capital behind what fighters become and how they become it so it comes from a position, when I'm talking to you, it comes from a position of being really interested in your sport. And it turns out that you and I have got a lot more in common yeah. than we anticipated. Yes. We both went to the same school and we both detested the same teacher, if you're still alive. Yep. We both went to a school in, in, um, in Old Causedom. Two schools, actually. Two schools, good schools as well. And a headmaster that believed in real discipline. It was the last school in England to abolish corporal punishment. I was one of the last to receive it. You were the year above me, yep. and we were both on the receiving I end I got of beaten with an inch of my life. Anyway, listen, one of the first things that we, I, I try to do is establish with the personalities, whether it's footballers, boxers, dart players, cricketers, whatever else, is to get to what makes them, what creates the person, what has created the person that sits opposite me. So I suppose the framing of the question I always put is, what is your why? If I try and think back, you know, it's funny, as we get older, we become much more reflective. And, and, and circumspect about the yeah, world. Yeah, and, and, and I'm certainly that. And I'm, I'm making deliberate changes in sort of how I view things and how my consciousness works. And my role as a manager and coach mm -hmm. in a very narcissistic, ego-driven and violent sport mm -hmm. now is something where I think I'm becoming quite adept at dropping into character and coming out of character on a daily basis. But what, why am I saying this? Because at heart, I am a kid that just likes playing sport mm -hmm. and have a very good imagination. I was quite a loner when I was younger, played a lot of football, um, was shy, a little bit quirky and geeky. And then um, there was a sequence of events that happened that then threw me on the path of boxing. Yeah. And that's, that. That was a big, drastic change within me at the age of Because it's a unique 14. sport to get into. I mean, you had 40 amateur fights, right? About that. Yeah. And I always try to understand because this sport is really unique because it has to have a certain mindset about it. To want to go into the hurt business, to want to go into a situation where you're going to have hurt inflicted upon you and you're going to inflict hurt on others. What drew you? to boxing in the first place? Did you, did you, was your father involved in it? Were your friends involved in it? What so I didn't grow you? up with my dad. I didn't actually meet my dad till right. I was 19. I grew up with my stepdad, Tom, okay. um, who was a very hard, cold, silent uh, Irishman from Galway. Okay. Um, he was, in, in, you know, in hindsight, he was involved in a lot of stuff when he was, you know, when I was a young kid that I didn't know about, but he was quite harsh and he must've looked at me and thought, this little soft kid needs toughening up a little mm -hmm. bit. Never said anything. I never called him dad. And we didn't actually talk that much throughout my whole upbringing. But <clears throat> there was a, it was a Wednesday, September the 16th. And it was a school night. 
and he fished me out of bed in the middle of the night and gave me a packet of biscuits and stuck me in the back of a car and took me to, to the Odeon Leicester Square to watch the Trigger Alien of Tommy Hearns 1 on Closed Circuit Quite in fun. 1981. Yeah. I had no idea why he did it. And I just remember watching it and being sort of fascinated and intimidated by the whole environment because it was a lot of aggressive fellas in a big cinema mm -hmm. at four o'clock in the morning. And uh, he then took me to uh, Croydon ABC, which was in Thornton Heath, yep. uh, the week later. And I absolutely hated it. The, the smell of the place terrified me. And that was it. About a year and a half later, he took me to another club, which was in Westrum, a little right. club. Um, and I fell in love with it. They put the gloves on me that day, on the very first day in the gym, and I sparred. Something happened, and I absolutely fell in love with the danger and the high of exchanging those right. moments with someone. And four weeks later, I had my first amateur belt. And, and so going from a, a very shy, sport-loving, mm -hmm. that geeky, quirky, little loner kid, developed a confidence at the age of 14 when you've got everything else going on in your body mm -hmm. that was you know, intoxicating and, and, and had a big impact on me. But that was where I fell in love with boxing. How, how good of a fighter? I mean, how good were you as an amateur? Well, I was talented. I was very talented. Like I played football, played for Croydon schools. I was good yep. at cricket. Uh, whatever sport I wanted to take my hand to, I was good at. So yep. I was really good uh, at mimicking and teaching myself. Um, and yeah, I had talent. But, you know, in, in wisdom, talent's just not enough. When you move into to training and you start to get into that territory and it's a journey for you, was it, was it, was it, a, was it, was it an automatic assumption in your mind that this is a, a viable option, it's an alternative? Did it, did it come by design? <clears throat> did it come by luck? Just happened. I, so I started going back to the gym. I was, going to the, I was friends with Mick Carney who ran the Fitzroy Lodge. And I started going and just training there. My friend Chris Oko was Commonwealth Cruiserweight champion at the time. I remember him, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so I used to go to the gym with Chris, knew I wasn't going to box again, uh, and then just started sparring and messing around. But then I thought, why am I doing this? So I turned around to Mick Carney one day and I said, can you just give me three fellas to do some pads with? I just want to do some pads rather than keep sparring and thinking that I might or might not. So he did. He gave me three kids. He gave me uh, a fellow called Robert who ended up severing his finger or something and never boxed. A guy called Manus Barber, who's become a lifelong friend. Right. And a young kid who called David Hay. Mm. And so the first time I met David, uh, he got in the ring, we started doing pads. And then each time I would go to the gym, he would want to do pads with me. Yeah. And it was because when I boxed, I never held my left hand up. I always carried my left hand low. And he liked the fact that I encouraged him to have that style. And so he, there was like 12 years between us in age. So he was 16 or 17 and we just used to enjoy doing, I enjoyed held, holding the pads and he enjoyed hitting them. And that was the accidental start of my coaching career. When you, um, I mean, uh, w um, leads me into David because it's a, it's one of those things that doesn't, it clearly doesn't define you, but it's a relationship that people associate with you. Um, did you click? Because David's an interesting character. I, I've come across him a few times. I, I don't. I wouldn't say we warm to one another that much. You two look to me at times like you were cut from the same cloth, which is you were very confident. You were both very sort of matter of fact in the way that you dealt with the media, and you both came across in a way that was, um, I wouldn't say stoic, but incredibly self-possessed and confident in what you were saying you finished questions with almost one word answers <laughs> so my question my question was at the beginning of that was did you click with him instantly um in the gym on the pads yes yeah uh, and then it was kind of like a big brother friendship role um i can understand why you might think we would possibly be cut from the same cloth because you see the end result of well, how I we thought, uh, my, react. my initial impression of you i thought you were a pair of cocky sods <laughs> i looked at you thinking Oh, you two have got tickets on one another. That was my impression. I don't get that impression now when I'm talking to you now. It was that... a deliberate. It was a deliberate choice to behave that way on my part, right? Because I love the sport and hate the business. Okay. And from the moment that I started coaching with, but that's him, interesting because you've morphed into promotion. <clears throat> well, I've managed and promoted, yeah, yeah but point. that was out of necessity. Right. Uh, so, uh, David turned pro. Let me go back to your question. Yeah. You know, David is, you know, I've known David since he was 16. I've s seen him evolve into a man. I've, we've spent so much time together. We lived together for a long period of time. 
but basically we spent every day together for I don't know how many years. So, you know, I know, I think I know what made him tick back in those days. And, and I guess, although David's very narcissistic and so he may not have been aware of how I was evolving on that journey. But I remember like everyone was an outsider and we kind of got off on that. We kind of got off on the fact that we were fortunate enough to have a contact that introduced us to the BBC, right. which meant we were able to navigate away from the traditional, you sign with a manager and you have a promoter, that tried and tested route of control that the bo boxing scene had. And we owe that to Audley Harrison because he broke that mold by going direct to the BBC after I remember, the gold medal. Yeah, and it was off the back of Audley, deal, yeah, yeah, yeah. off the back of Audley that we had that opportunity. But I had to use a manager with a license because they didn't have a manager's license. So we did. We paid a manager to, to use his license until I got my own. So I then took over management, but really in a way to protect the career so that there was no outside influence or mm -hmm. corrupted behavior. And then that spread into getting my pro promoter's license and doing the deals with Sky, again, to protect David and the business of David. And it was more so out of necessity to protect what we were doing rather than, oh, okay, I want to be a manager and promoter. Talk to me about David, I mean, uh, as the fighter, as the personality. I mean, you use the expression narcissism. I find in my uh, experience of not so much talking to the guys and, and having a conversation, but when you talk about them and the sport itself and you dare to criticise somebody, and as long as the criticism is fair, I think criticism is fair. If you're being an arsehole and you're saying things to be personally disrespectful to someone, then people should get prickly. But I've never seen a sport like it. I mean, football has its own little set of rules and prima donnas and people, you mustn't say this and you mustn't say that. And I didn't really care much for that either. But I've never seen a sport that's so, uh, for, such, for such a sport driven by such machismo, everybody gets so offended and starts crying so quickly the moment you'd say anything that's, what they consider to be uh, critical. You talked about David and narcissism and, and w when you look at David and his career and the journey that you went on him with him, how do you reflect upon it? It's fantastic. I mean, it was, we got so many memories of so many moments in time mm -hmm. that, you know, for as long as my brain works, I can just lay there and always recall on. And I look back at our friendship and working relationship together with fond memories. Right. And what, like was anything, was it, what was the start of that relationship? Was it a democracy? Was it a dictatorship? No, no, no. It was like, it was two fellas that had each other's backs. He knew, right. like, I, I truly believe he knew that I was never going to lie to him, that and he saw everything, every contract we ever yep. did, like we would talk through because couldn't trust the lawyers because they make mistakes on your behalf. Like we learned that process. And so, no, it was, it was very um, transparent to, you know, there were things he might try and hide from me, you know, like if he was cheating in training or, but it, mm -hmm. I would see them. But looking back on it, no, I mean, it was a hell of a ride. When I, when I first held the pads for him at the Fitzroy Lodge, um, and then I coached him and in the amateurs, he got knocked out in the first round in the, I think the national semis of the ABA is by a fellow called Jim Twight from Coventry, who going forward, I would probably never have used as a sparring partner, but J David just turned up thinking that's all he had to do, mm -hmm. was half asleep, got hit, hit on the temple and stopped in the first round. Um, and then rolling on, he had a, uh, a flash in the pan start to his pro career, didn't live the life and gets his ass handed to him by Carl Thompson. Carl Thompson like, yeah. Who would have ever have thought when he got stopped by Jim Twight, or knocked out by Carl Thompson because he'd gassed, mm. that he would have become what he unified became. cruiserweight yeah. and world heavyweight champion. So how can I not look back at that journey of, in just you know, admiration of the, what we did together? Because I never thought it would happen, but it did. But the nature of the relationship, because it's a fascinating relationship that trainers have with, with boxers, because there is this life and death thing with the nature of your relationship with David, uh, my point was not so much about the dictatorial or the democ democratic approach to business, but the preparation of the fighter to fight and to exact and to execute the game plan and for you to impress your style of vision. Was it your vision for David Hay to behave or fight or to have a game plan in a certain way? And do fighters like David Hay and trainers like you 
build that rapport, build that dynamic? Is it a natural? Is it something that you worked at very hard? Or are you or a trainer that, that exists in a space where you're so strong and robust and such a strong leader that you can demand and command that from your fighter? It was both. Um, remember, it was my first journey as a coach. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, his, his only journey as a pro fighter. Um, we saw things the same way. I knew what David's weaknesses were. So as a coach, it's to protect the weaknesses and vulnerabilities and expose the strengths it, 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 and in your game plan. You can't, you know, David was never going to be an up-close hooker because because of his balance and, and the dominant strengths that he had. Um, as an amateur, he was literally just this genetic freak that could put anyone to sleep. But he had no defensive acumen. And I grew up in love with people like Sugar Ellen and Wilfred Benitez and mm -hmm. Roberto Duran. And, and the, the sort of cunning art of their defense is something I learned to love from the age of 13. So I imparted how I sort of saw boxing from when I was young into David Stahl. So he had some defensive acumen and, and he evolved that element to his game to go alongside his freakish genetic capabilities. In terms of game plans, yes, there was a moment when he um, was training for his first world title fight against Jean-Marc Mormek and we were yeah. in Cyprus and it was just him and I and it had become a cooking pot of this together every single day we moved there to get him away from london it was just him and him and me in this little villa and we'd found this metalwork shack and put a ring and a, and a spotlight a punch bag and a bit of carpet to skip on um and the training for mormek went off about 17 weeks but there was a moment where there was something i'd identified with mormek and i said to david look you really need to be adept now at kicking back into the right because of how Mormek's trying to leak your position. You can't just keep going to the left to get away from the left hook. There was a technical thing that I wanted him to do with his legs that didn't come naturally to him because he was very wide stanced. Anyway, we're trying to do it. We're trying to do it. And, he's, and he, like, he just was getting frustrated. And we're sitting in the car outside the villa. And, uh, and I said, Dave, we, we, we got to work on this. And he, he got frustrated. And he said, well, I can't do it. That's not me, so I'm not, not, not going to do it. We're sitting outside the villa. Now, there must have been, I think, six weeks of training left. Five or six weeks of training left. And so now my, my sort of pride kicks in. I said, all right, so what do you want to do? He said, I'll figure, out when I, I'll figure it out when I get in there. I said, that's how you want to do this? Yeah. I said, I'm, but I'm not a cheerleader. You, that's how you want to do it? Yeah, that's how I'm going to do it. Like, he, the doors are shut down. He's a stubborn fella. And that was what it was going to be. He'd gone inside, but we'd been living together like this for ages anyway. So I'm sitting now sitting down in my bedroom. He's watching TV in the lounge. So I didn't want to go out there. I didn't want to be next to him. We'd, we'd start, yeah. In that moment, we hated each other. But there were, I'd never had anyone I could call on to show me, try this, do that. I was all, all the time. It was very, a very lonely existence in my own consciousness. Anyway, it was about four o'clock in the morning. I'm still awake and I'm just let stewing on it overnight. And I thought, fuck this. Packed my suitcase and went to the airport in Northern Cyprus, flew back to England, didn't speak to him, didn't tell him I was going, didn't phone him, and we didn't speak for, I think, two and a half weeks. Right. The three-week period is in my head, so it might have been six or seven weeks before, but there was a significant period right before his first world title fight where I had just upped and left because the accumulation of certain things and this moment in the car had just, I, was like, I can't do it, I'm not doing this anymore, I'm done with it. M money was never my modus operandi I would, I would never cared about the money it was about I, this is how i want to live this is what i think we should do for some reason i went back my con like i felt awful while i was here felt sick every day what am i doing and we're like oh, he's just there by himself and i know fuck it if he wants to do it it was backwards and forwards every day so eventually I, I flew back and um i got into the i got into the villa and he's there and we i walk in he just looks at me he half looks at me and looks away and we don't speak I go to my bedroom, unpack my suitcase, go out, get something to eat. And I think I arrived in the morning and he just said to me, uh, I hope you, I hope I'm, I'm portraying how oh, so intense this moment in time was. And he, and, and he just said, what time's gym tonight? And I wasn't that, I'm, it's up to you, your choice. You make the rules apparently. Your choice. Yeah. He said, seven o'clock, I'll see you there. Didn't go with him. At seven o'clock, he's not he's not in the villa. I've rocked up to the gym at 7.30 and sat down on chair. So when I say gym, it's a sh it's metal corrugated iron shack it's in shack, the boiling yeah. heat in the sun. And I'm sitting there and he's and he's shadowboxing. And while he's shadowboxing, he's trying to show me that he was gonna do 
the thing that we'd fallen out of in the car, which was this how, how a, way, a certain way to step to the right. And when I saw that, I thought, okay. And then I went to say something. And as I went to say something, his eyes locked on me. And in that moment, I knew I got him. Yeah. And then the last three or four weeks of that training camp was magnificent. That that next six month period with David was him doing what he could have done his entire career to be so much better than he ever was. Yeah. He was the he was the consummate professional in that final lead up to Mormec, in the Mormec fight itself, in the preparation for Macronelli and in the Macronelli fight. That was it. And then once he went to heavyweight, it started to fall apart again. Right. How good a cruiserweight was he? One of the one of the best he's ever been, I think. In his when in in that period, like I said, in the lead up to Mormac and the Macronelli fight, there are if you take maybe um, Holyfield. Yeah, I was going to say Holyfield. Yeah, Dwight Muhammad Kawi or Dwight yeah. Braxton. Yeah, Usyk. Although I think Usyk's style would have suited David. Right. But I would, if he had stayed cruiserweight and stayed on that path of being what he was in that period, I'd match him with any of them. Whose idea was it to go up to heavyweight? His. I mean, after the so after the Macronelli fight, he's doing his interview and he's got his draped with all these belts and we've just yeah. done Macronelli on a Frank Warren show yeah. and all the backstory behind that. So we, I, I'm just on a high. And, and all of a sudden he's doing an interview and he's saying, I'm done with cruiserweight. And then I'm going up to heavyweight and he starts going on about the Klitsch goes, he never told me any of this. That was him. What about the value of fight? I mean, he's, he's fighting a seven foot giant. Seven foot two. Seven foot two. How'd you prep for that? Run. But the, ir the irony right. thing is that he had an injury in that training, which meant he didn't run a single day for that fight. That's when we used the Versa climber. We started using the Versa climber because he had a problem with one of his legs. And if you look, if you look at photographs of the fight, you'll see that one of his boots is actually a cast. So we prepare for that fight without running, knowing that, the, and I said, like, if you look, if, the more you try and engage with Valuev, the bigger chance you give him of winning. This fight, we can't fight the judges. This fight has to be won with as little output as possible because everything you do has to be so unpredictable so that this program giant can't just feed off you going into his space. All, and the, the, the trouble with that one was that it required a lot of legwork and he couldn't run. Right, but he ends up, after beating Valuev, fighting Vladimir. So there were two defences, remember? He, he, he defended against John Ruiz yeah. and then against I'm going to jump past those. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I know that they're part of the heavyweight story, but but I don't want to spend all my time talking to you about David Hay. Okay. But I want to get this part over the, the, the line in terms of the, the the nature of a fight that you prepared him for. Because I want to get into your mind because the performance that he the noise that went with it, the background noise of what David was going to do and how he was going to do it, um, and what he thought of the Klitschko's and so on and so forth, didn't manifest itself in really one scintilla of the performance mm -hmm. and the ridicule and the parody that came there on afterwards. But what what did you, when you look back on that performance, at the night, what did you, what were you looking at? What did you think you were looking at? And when you look back on it now, I think, what was I looking at? Well, I know he was injured. Like he, he, his toe had, had literally been snapped in two. So he had uh, injections in it. Prior to the fight. In the change room beforehand. Right. So he starts warming up, but it wasn't enough. So you could still feel the toe. They thought we were doing gamesmanship, delaying the ring walk. We weren't. It's because he had to take the boot off and have it re-injected again. Right. Um, but forget all that. Vlad was naturally the bigger man by at least two and a half stone in his prime mm -hmm. with a wealth of experience, Olympic gold medalist. With a, He paid his dues as a champion, got knocked out, got himself back but together. you've seen people like Corey Sanders put him on his ass. Yeah, and that was part of Vladimir becoming a better fighter. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. he was actually a more entertaining fighter before he got knocked out. And then he kept that away. But a better winner yeah. after he'd been yeah. knocked out. And he was too big, too shrewd, and just too good for David, who was the smaller man. And what you had was an excellent big one against a very, very good little Yeah. And they'll always win, won't they? Yeah. So there was a lot of um, a reaction to David's response to explain the injury. Do you think that was fair? I was honest, like, I didn't care. I don't think he cared. We were always, right from the start, don't care what other people think. We'll do what we think is right. He lost to the better man when he got up on the chair to show his toe. And like, remember, we've just lost like the World Heavyweight Champions. So I, I didn't give a shit about anything by this point. Yeah. I'm sitting at the press conference thinking, why are we here? 
And uh, as he's gone to get up, Vladimir has obviously offered up excuses for his losses in the past and got ruined for doing so. And I remember as David got up in the chair, I remember Vladimir looking at me and getting my attention, looking at me like that and saying, don't do it. He said it to me to stop him. Right. But in that moment, it was too, like David's grabbed my hand and gone up on the chair and shown his toe. And of course that became the focal point. But, uh, but ultimately, I didn't care about the criticism. He lost to the better man. He lost his World Heavyweight Championship. And what anyone said really didn't matter. Um, the next time, I mean, not the next time, but then, then there becomes this controversy that you, you become embroiled in which is the Chisora situation and the melee that went with that. I think you got a whack on the head, didn't you? And what 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 was all that about? Well, we actually... So I mean, De Derek is what Derek is, isn't he? I mean, Derek's a showman. He wants to get attention. And, and we've seen him over the years do it. And he's, he, he's a pretty decent bloke, isn't he, Derek Chisora? But what was all that about? And so we went... So Vitaly was fighting Derek. We'd said after the loss of Vlad, right, let's try and get the rematch or try and get Vitaly. And if not, we'll walk away. Done. You've got the money. You don't need it. The plan was always to be in and out with the health. So let's see. Okay, well, he's fighting Derek. Should we go over there? Let's go over there. So we've gone over to watch the fight. Derek goes a distance, loses on points. We're sitting downstairs after him. I said, should we go up to the press conference? It, none of this was planned. But it was to have a pop at Burnt Bunter and to try and get to Vitaly because they just weren't sending the contract. Right. But they said that they wanted the fight. David was completely out of shape, uh, hadn't trained for a while. And that was so that was it. And then all of a sudden, David starts piping up because he realizes he's losing his opportunity to try and publicly get hold of Italy. Right. But Derek interrupts. And then Burnt Bunter happily put, like, puts the spotlight on that. And then Derek being Derek just thought, do you know what? There's not there possibly another opportunity here. <laughs> I'll pick up the microphone. And and Derek was just acting. I don't think Derek planned to do anything. Mm -hmm. um, but I know what David's like. David whacks first and thinks second. Oh, by the way, you remember, you know, I got hit by the tripod, right? And I, know and I had this black coming down. What no one realizes, Derek's a lovely dude with yeah, I know he is, yeah. a, a big heart, right? I'd said something to Bert Bunter and then I'd gone downstairs to try and find the car that we had. And as I've gone downstairs, Derek's come running out of this door, this fire exit door, towards me with a handful of tissues because he wanted to clean the blood off my head. He was worried about me right. in that moment. Right. And I'll never forget that. And, and I liked Derek before because actually in 2008, we're in the York Hall. David, I think it was around the time when David had become world champion. We're at York Hall for a show on the top floor. And this amateur heavyweight comes up to us and says, I'm in the ABAs, but I'm going to work with you guys. And we're like, all right, good luck, son. It was him right? as an amateur. So I remember him from back then. And uh, yeah, it was an interesting part of my career. I've always loved this, this uh, situation that occurred between Tyson Fury and David Hay. And uh, you were sat in the green room with Tyson and Mick Hennessy sat on the sofa with David. And then obviously you had the press conference before where Tyson's taking the piss and being what Tyson Fury was. And I just wondered what you made of that because I remember watching you thinking, I'm not sure what you're making of this because I did think that David got his pants pulled down a little bit by Tyson. Well, here's, so here's the thing, like where David had been the, 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 the baddie and the trash talker, yeah. we deliberately went to that press conference. If you look at what David wore, so just present yourself now as a more experienced man. Let him be the big mouth. Let him yeah. be the one that's not got the experience. And if you look, he kind of had like an, a, a, an Oxford boy look about him. He wore the blazer with the chino trousers. That was a deliberate Oh, yeah, I impression. remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Blue blazer and with so, the gold buttons. And so yeah. David chose to let him be the loud one. And people take that as, oh, well, all of a sudden, how come David's not piping up anymore? It's just because we had had this conversation about him being just the one that stays regal and dignified and let him be the one that sells it, right? Right. What that ended up being is people thinking, oh, he's got the better of David. Because but David, I know, just chose on that occasion not to say anything. But but also in that moment, if you've got someone that really will wreck. Well, well given examples of, I mean, I thought Tyson, I thought, I mean, I watched it and I'm an objective watcher of things. And I had no vested interest in David Hay or Tyson Fury. But I remember David Hay giving analogies like, you know, you might think you can beat Usain Bolt. But you can't. I might think I can. And Tyson Fury went, well, I don't need to beat Usain Bolt. I just need to beat you. And I just thought it was a... It was, so you're saying that was a constructed approach to look more 
to have more gravitas and dign dignity than Tyson that was going to behave the way Tyson does. So, yeah, there was absolutely... I mean, the, the Usain Bolt reference, no, that probably just popped in his, yeah. into his head at the time. No, there was a deliberate conversation where... He, you know, remember he'd gone with the decapitated head T-shirts to the into the Klitschko. Yeah, okay. Day. Yeah, well, and like, dude, I had to stop now, literally yeah. strangling me that day. Yeah. So we we done the like the the trash talking, big mouth braggart role. Yeah, here's Tyson that's inexperienced and a bit nervy. Is this you? Is this you being honest about how that was, or is this now you conjuring an image back in retrospect? Go, I've looked at it now, and that's a good a story <laughs> rather than the reality of it. I don't really think was. I've never said this to anyone. Right. But that's what it was. Now, had David decided to go at him a bit more, would he have got the better of it? Probably not. Like Tyson was reckless and all over the place with what he was saying. But sitting, in the, sitting with Tyson, so I put, made the fight with Mick and, and I'd obviously met Tyson when putting the fight together. But I remember he was, I was convinced that he was very unsure of himself. Tyson? Yeah. He very sounded unsure. though, did he? Huh? He didn't sound it. No, he was very unsure of himself. He was very nervous, not necessarily scared of David. What I'm yeah, saying is he was a very energy. nervous, yeah. insecure right. man. The man that there is today is, is like Holding that fella that's yeah. gone through these mental tortures that he's mm. put on himself and come out the other side. Along the way, getting dropped and realised, well, I can actually get back and punch back here. He's evolved into the fight that he is now, but what he was then isn't what he is now. And I know how hard David hits and I know how quick he can land. So I was confident that David was going to win the fight. Yeah, I know. I saw you. Were, yeah. um, and I was confident in my, assess in my assessment of Tyson. I knew that, <laughs> here's the thing, right? I got a long spine and short legs. And I remember sitting on this, before we started the, the, the bit live, it's this hard little wooden slap bench. And yeah. I'm sitting there like that and I'm looking at him and I went, do me a favour. Just sit up straight. Like we we got on, we were polite with each other, right? I said, "Do me a favor, sit up straight." And as we sat up straight, our eyes and eyebrows were exactly the same height, and I'd never clocked that before. So I've gone, "Fuck, this fella's all arms and legs and no spine." So you're going to have no target to aim at on that body, right? So, and I remember going away from that thinking, "Forget anything to the body. Mm -hmm. If anything, just make him think you're going to hit the body to go at the head, because all he's got to do is that, and you can't get any. You're just going to hit elbows." But I remember sitting next to him thinking he's a physical freak because he's got the longest arms I've ever seen on a man mm. and, and the shortest spine in comparison. So my takeaway from that program, ringside program you're referring to, was I thought he was nervous and a bit insecure, but he had this freakish physical structure that was going to make it a bit trickier than I thought. When you, um, when you split from him, why did you split? Well, it wasn't a split. So we said after Vlad... Let's get Vitley or walk away. Yeah. We'd done the smash and grab approach that we always said we were going to try and do. Then Derek comes along. Okay, after Derek, let's get Vitaly or we're done with it. And that was it. So the Vitaly fight never happened. There was no taste for the fight. Time went on. I knew the injuries that David had accumulated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then there were the, the, the two, I think two withdrawals because of injuries with Tyson Fury. It's like, okay, well, you can't hold up anymore. It's just like, there's no point in doing this. And that was it. And then the next thing I heard, there's talk of him wanting to have a comeback. And when, when I was hearing it from sort of mutual friends, I was thinking, oh, he just wants a bit of money. Yeah, because, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I mean, so there was no acrimony. No, in it. I think he knew that yeah. that wasn't something I would want yeah. to be part of. Did you think on the second fight when he fought Tony Bellew that there was going to be an improvement? Because obviously he'd gone in... And he'd done this big four-act play about sitting on a yacht and Miami didn't need to train and all that sort of stuff. And, and you're making a case for the perhaps he wasn't doing the training right. No, I thought actually it benefited Tony more because Tony realised that he could take David's shots right. and he would have probably been more confident. The one risk with David is he can hit you and you don't know how you're going to cope with it. But I think going into the second fight, Tony knew that he could take what David had. And so I think Tony was probably more confident in the second fight. What do you think during your period of time or today at this moment in time is your greatest achievement as a trainer? Not selling out. What does that mean? Not selling out to the business, not being pals with the promoters just because I want to keep the money coming and I'll keep it. Not just a coach, I'm now talking as a manager and that's a completely different conversation sure. now, right? Um, when I look at myself in the mirror, I didn't sell out to any of them. I didn't, I didn't negotiate a way that they wanted me to negotiate to keep myself in the picture for, you know, like, Promoters make money, and the more they want to make money, right? They make more money by 
bringing in less and paying out more. Sure. The managers are there to negotiate for the fighters, right? But promoters don't like managers that know where all the money is. They don't like being squeezed for yeah. the maximum value of the fighter. What constitutes, in your role as a trainer, put aside the management and promoter side, because we've covered that bit, what constitutes success for you in that role? Mm. Is it the wins? Is it the title? I'm going to sound, like an, I'm well, going to sound like an arsehole here then, because it's about taking the fighters that I care about and fall in love with yep. and helping them fulfill whatever their potential is as a fighter and financially whilst protecting as many brain cells as possible. So it's a very holistic out outlook, isn't it? But from the start, I remember having a conversation with David in KFC and Marble Arch before he turned pro, but we were talking about going pro because he was done with the amateurs. And it was about get in and out with as much money as possible, with as little damage as possible. And that has been my primary subconscious um yeah ideal yeah yeah british trainers do you think i mean there's a lot being made at this moment in time or there's a debate about who's training whom and and why and you're seeing more british fighters seemingly having overseas coaches specifically american ones do you think um the british trainers are operating at the best in class would you have considered yourself to be best in class? Don't know. I've never. I've uh, had on my heart. I've never. Do I have a view of myself? Well, you must have. You've no, got I've got a conviction. Confident fellow, aren't you? Right. I've got a conviction in how I think it should be done, and yeah. I've got a conviction and confidence in how I see it, um, because we all think we're doing it right. I don't. You know. You, you show me a, a, a dentist that's a dentist and said I can do your teeth for you, but I'm shit at it. Yeah, Everyone yeah. thinks they're doing sure, it right. Sure. Time proves right. whether you. Or, or not you know i've you know i've been all around the place i've been in so many gyms around the world and so many gyms in america and uh, you know around coaches with real high reputations and i realized that there's a lot of shit out there and a lot of crap being spoken and and i've heard the same over here but the same token i've heard some fantastic coaches talk mm. but probably the best coaches i've he heard speak you never hear of they just don't either turn pro or have the fighters that can highlight their capabilities i was fortunate enough that i had a fighter that highlighted that i potentially had capability as a coach mm -hmm. but without that highlight fighter you just you, you know the chance of you being well, the successful. reason why i kind of ask it is because ben davidson he made an observation recently um which i would think that you might have a reaction to which is that he felt other trainers in this country this is a quote direct from him I feel like the level of coaching is poor in this country. They're lazy. And the reality of it, I outwork them. That's the reality. I may have, they may have 30 or 40 years on me, but, but the amount of time I spend studying the sport, my fighters, the opponents, it's unrivaled work. So he's thinking of himself as a progressive thinker um, and a new generation, a next gen of fighting coach. Do you think there's anything in that? Do you, do you look at that and think, I beg your fucking pardon? <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or is he on to something? Well, I don't know. Pff, to me, it sounds like clickbait sales pitch. That's what that sounds like. It sounds like what he's saying is, I'm better than all the others because I outwork them. That's what yeah. that sounds like. Outthink them. Outthink them. But, yeah. you know, you know, as coaches, you realize that you win and you lose. And, you know, we believe we're doing it right. But ultimately, you're only as good as the fighter that you're working with. As a, I mean, as a trainer, could you make head nor tail of the... Because I think Rob McCracken is a great trainer. But, but I could never make sense of what happened in that first fight between Joshua and Usyk and what decisions Anthony Joshua made in that fight and what his trainer must have been saying to him. Because, again, excuse my layman-esque approach to it and educate me with the parlance of the industry. I'm watching Anthony Joshua fight the very fight that he... The only way that... Usyk could have won that fight was for Anthony Joshua to fight the way he did and that's the way he fought and I'm watching it thinking well there is this great trainer in the corner what the fuck is going on here how is this manifesting itself how is this playing out this way what, what was what was your view and if you were in that situation and you're seeing Anthony Joshua do everything that you must have told him to do something different I can't, well, I, I can't remember the, I can't actually remember the specific, specifics of that fight but I remember thinking, okay, well, the one way that Valuev could have beaten Hay 
is if he'd not boxed him. Yeah. If he'd literally just ran across the ring, swinging his arms like a novice lunatic till eventually there was no space between them and could just keep clubbing him on the head. If, if, if he'd decided to fight David that way, probably would have been a completely different outcome, but yeah. he didn't. He tried to play the game. And I think AJ with Usyk tried to play the game. He tried to box with him. He tried to prove that he was the better skilled fighter when actually but McCracken must have there he, must have been what, a game plan but we, there? you know we can all get it wrong at times I don't you don't know was, was there was that the game plan or was it not the game plan right. did Rob McCracken say listen don't worry about boxing him just tear into him well that was everyone before the fight I mean I don't want to be too specific said the one the, only, the one way that Anthony Joshua wins this fight is uses his size and strength and the very thing that he didn't do was that and I just have never understood and I'm, I'm not asking I mean, you can't be a mind reader but the disconnect between what must have been said Mm. And what master manifests itself? Are you are you, are you, are you suggesting that that looks like a game plan? No, well, I don't know, but also you you I know got, you don't know, but but also you got to go back and think. Okay, well, AJ's gone through the international circuit, yeah. and he he would have been turning up at these international tournaments, at these tournaments with everyone there looking at Lomachenko, or look, looking at Usyk, thinking they're the gods of amateur boxing. Mm -hmm. So he's already got in his subconscious this. Okay, I'm second place yeah, to this inferiority complex. Yeah, yeah, and I yeah. think I think that that probably played out at moments of the fight where he's getting caught with shots and he's accepting okay i'm getting caught with that because you know some this is in his subconscious yeah he's better than me at that he, he probably conceded without knowing it because of his admiration of Usyk. I, I have to ask this question because he's such a fascinating character anthony joshua and I, I'm, so many people say that he's the high tide that made all the boats rise and I'm always being castigated for saying he's a flat track bully, he's done, he hasn't beat anyone of real repute. Tyson Fury is a generational great in this area. Because I think that the moment he went to this dark place against um, Vladimir Klitschko, pulled himself off the canvas, did what it took to win, and went in against Ruiz, and he's never been the same fighter that went into that fight against Klitschko. And I think as fighters, there's this uniqueness that I'm always fascinated mm -hmm. about, is this preparedness. Barry spoke about the preparedness to go into a dark place, McGuigan, and to do whatever it takes and to stare into the abyss and not see the abyss back, but see the ability to be able to go, I'm going to go there and it's going to be me or him and it's going to be him. And I, from my limited view of the world, boxing world, think that that light has gone out in Anthony Joshua. You as a trainer, do you do you think he can get it? But do you think do you think I'm right in that? Saying. I hear what you're saying. Do you think I'm right in that? And do you think if I'm if I am right, then can it be something you get back? Is AJ gun shy? Yeah. Subsequent to the Vladimir Klitschko fight, or is he developing a better fighter with self-preservation instincts? Vladimir Klitschko, we mentioned it before, gets mm -hmm. knocked out by Corey Sanders, comes back a better winner but a less entertaining fighter. Yeah. Because his primary concern is not getting knocked out whilst winning. Anyone that's been knocked out or concussed in a fight knows what that feels like. Mm -hmm. And it's a terrifying experience that no one ever sees. So if you don't know after that Klitschko win. How much it took out of him? Well, how much he was hurt. Yeah. Was he concussed? Was he thrown up that night and with the blistering headache and the confusion and coming out of that concussion thinking, geez, I don't want that to happen again. It's not a nice thing. So... If, you know, being concussed or experiencing that makes someone go, do you know what? I'm going to be a bit more savvy here and I'm going to make sure I'm not getting hit. And I, if I don't need to be in a war, why be in a war? You know, some fighters go in there and say, I'm prepared to die to get this win. Yeah. But I think the majority of fighters are going there saying, well, I'm prepared. I'm prepared myself to win, but I'm not willing to die for this. And I'm not willing to give myself damage for this. And, you know, you get winners and losers in, mm. in, in both. You know, so to say... To say the light's gone out, I think would be a bit disrespectful to AJ. I don't think that's the case. I think that he is just being a smarter man. Well, that's because I suppose people are making the argument. You're making a, a more rounded argument, which is using the Klitschko in analogy of changing his style to be able to achieve outcomes. I suppose when people are thinking about Anthony Joshua needing to reignite that person that went across the ring and knocked people out and put himself in the way of it, is their belief, I suppose, if I'm paraphrasing, that that's the only way he can do the things that he needs to do because he probably doesn't have the ability to do anything else. No, I disagree. He doesn't just have to wade in and 
take risks to win fights. He's a big man. He's an incredible athlete with, you know, st even to this day, an evolving uh, boxing IQ. Mm. So, no, I think that's a, a very, I think that's a... So, okay, do you think he wins a world title then? Can he win a world heavyweight title? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, do you think he will? Well, who's he got to beat? He's got to beat either Usyk or Tyson Fury. Oh, well, yeah. Well, I think I don't think he beats Usyk. Right. I, I don't think Usyk will hang around long enough to fade in his skill sets to give AJ the opportunity. Uh, I think Tyson Fury beats Usyk because he won't make the mistake. Mm -hmm. Tyson knows how to hustle a fight. He knows yeah. how to win ugly. And I think that he wins that fight ugly. I think you saw Usyk was close to his limit physically in the second AJ fight. Yeah. Where he, although he looked composed, you could see that it took everything out of him just to stay that far ahead of him. Tyson's not going to let him do that. So now you match Tyson Fury with AJ. I think AJ's got a better chance in that fight than Usyk does. If history has proven itself, you probably have to favor Tyson. Mm -hmm. I would favor Tyson because of his freakish reach. It means that AJ is going to get caught with the jab. And when AJ gets caught with the jab, he kind of takes this moment to try and, he's not used to being outboxed with jabs. And I think that will be a very basic thing, right? You can control the fight with the jab, but I think that the fact that Tyson will reach AJ in a way that AJ is uncomfortable with, I favor um, Tyson. But any heavyweight that hits that hard has always got a chance of winning. Mm -hmm. So yes, he does have a chance of winning the World Heavyweight title. Hmm. If, you know, if Deontay is putting Tyson down and almost keeping him down, I know AJ hits as hard as Deontay at any given moment in time. So you have to give him a chance. But I do make Tyson the favourite. When you look at Usyk, and and again, I've made the observation that people are making, which is the one that the weakness that he has is the body shots. How would you be coaching Usyk to exploit Tyson Fury's weaknesses? He's going to have to work his ass off. He's going to have to be a cruiserweight version of Lomachenko. He's going to have right. to be able to move his feet, his head, and his hands simultaneously. No fighter in the history of boxing has ever done that as well as uh, Vasily Lomachenko. Mm -hmm. And I idolize Duran, Leonard, and Benitez. But I have to admit that Lomachenko is the most technically advanced fighter I've ever seen. And Usyk needs to be a cruiserweight version of that because he's got to overcome the natural weight disadvantage, so avoid the physical imposition of will, um, and also get past that freakish reach and that freakish left hand that is constantly going to be in front of his face. And the only way you're going to do that is to be a, a, and to actually have moments where you're asserting yourself, he's going to have to simultaneously move his feet, head and hands at the same time, in and out of distance, against a fella that's probably going to try and roughhouse him at times as well. So he's first got to be technically brilliant and he's then got to be physically conditioned to be able to maintain it whilst also preparing himself to get roughed up. It's a, I mean, for Usyk, it's a monumental challenge just because of the size of the challenge of Tyson Fury. And you think who wins that fight? I think Fury wins because he knows how to win ugly. He knows if, if the boxing isn't working, psychologically he's got other game he can mm. go to. And he's become seasoned at that now. So I just think, I think because he's got different ways to win the fight and that natural size advantage, I have to face Gives him more advantages. Yeah. Gear change for you. Um, Chris Eubank Jr., you have a... Um, a relationship with him of sorts or you get involved with him to some extent where you're shaking your head for you so do. I worked with him for two fights and that was it yeah well that's a relationship isn't it? oh I thought you said you have sorry no no you had mm. you had a relationship with him I've spoken about Chris Eubank Jr. I've become much more of an admirer of him because I think he's a remarkable showman in the way that he's managed to sell himself to the British media and make really good money out of not really winning very much how difficult a relationship was that? Because you had some challenges with him, didn't you? In terms of his aspirations for the outlook of how he wanted to train. Um, no, he no. seems to have made observations about you that ultimately you've come into his gym. He wants to operate in a certain way, which seems to be a bit like ass about face. If you're the trainer, I'm sure you should be dictating the pace. No, it, that's only relate that, that, that only relates to one moment where I decided that I didn't want to work with him anymore. But up until that point, we actually, the, when we, 
we worked for two fights, Tony Jetta and then um, Spike O'Sullivan. Mm -hmm. And actually the training for the Spike O'Sullivan was, was actually a, an enjoyable training camp because it was just him and me in the gym. There was no interference. And he, for that moment in time, I believed that he was coachable and we were working on things that actually showed up in the fight. Um, so believed he was coachable. It, we, I, I, he was coachable from me in that period because I had his attention. He was working on the things that we were talking about in the gym and he showed them out in the fight. And in the fight, I remember saying, don't load up yet. He's going to, mm. he's, he's going to quit. He's breaking down. He's losing his combat. So it, that one fight did feel like it was better than the previous one. And then, uh, and then he was, uh, he gave me a call one day and said, uh, I'm sparring tomorrow in Brighton. Can you come and watch? So I thought, okay. Cause it was well, there was no fight lined up or anything. So I've gone to the gym and then, uh, and then there was a, I watched what happened. Uh, Ronnie Davis was taking sparring. I was in the background watching. And then there was this interaction and I just thought, Did you, this is not for me. This is not for me. And I just, that was it. That was the end of it. A lot of people have said that there's a difficulty with the Eubanks and it's, a, it's, it's almost a nightmare scenario where you've got these two great, huge personalities, specifically senior. But for your experience with these two characters, was it an easy experience? You've got a legend with very strong views about what his son should get. He talks about the reasons why his son got nine million for XYZ fights because of me and because of my reputation and because of the legacy that goes with me. For you, being on the receiving end of that sort of dynamic, easy to work with, difficult to work say, with? I wouldn't say it's easy to work with. Never, it's never going to make it easier to work with. Um, I do think that Junior benef has certainly benefited from his dad's name. He's not won a world title, but he's earned yeah. significant money. Yeah. But it also, in his defence, he's fought some good fighters. He's fought Billy Joe Saunders yeah. and George Groves. Yeah. So he's never shirked away from proving himself But he's gotten beaten by them, though. He has, but, yeah. he's but they were still entertaining close fights yeah. right billy joe the reason why he lost to billy joe is he, he doesn't like southpaws and he couldn't figure out the hustle in the first half of the fight but towards the end of the fight he actually started winning the rounds against billy joe but he was too far behind billy joe just knew too much and was was too quick southpaw style and just knew how to hustle him um billy joe saunders said in this lovely way that not while he's got a hole in his ass will he win a world title will he win a world title do you go down that route well, who's he got to beat to win a world title? That's what you've got to look at. Who's champion now? Uh, what, at 160 or 168? One, one, uh, well, no, he's 160, isn't he? he? Well, he, well, he was fighting at 168. He's now down at 160. Yeah. Um, who's there? Hmm. Charlo, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. One of the Charlos. Yeah. Who hasn't boxed for a while. Mm -hmm. Char uh, I'd make Charlo the favourite there. Yeah. If they navigate him a route... Anyone, you know, any decent fighter could be navigated a route to a world championship, but is he going to be the best in the world? No, I'd agree with Billy Joe. Uh, Junior can be ferocious in putting his punches together and being in this physical energy in front of you, but he's not the best boxer. Like, he can be outboxed. And Which he, is what Billy Joe said. And he's also... Billy Joe said he can fight, but he can't box. But he, I don't think he carries the same fighting energy that he used to. You know, right. He came to my gym countless times to spar with George Groves and people like Nathan Cleverly. And you watch it and think, Jesus, this fella's ferocious. But fighters that have that ferocious energy as part of their asset normally burn out, out quicker. quicker. Right. For you, the landscape of boxing, the doping that's going on. I, I, there's a lot going on in the sport right now. And obviously, Conor Ben is the, is the big example of what we've seen. Robert Hellenius, we've seen Dillian White, we've seen Alicia Bumgarden in the world, in the women's sport. Um, I spoke to Malik Scott, um, Deontay Wilder's, Wilder's trainer, by the way, was a really interesting character. I know Malik, yeah. Really interesting character. Um, how clean he talked about, Spencer Oliver talks about 60% of fighters. This guy, Malik, was talking about 50, 60% of fighters doping. At the highest level you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. How, I mean, what's your view on that? I've lost uh, faith in the sport in that sense. I agree with them. I think it's rife. There are so many ways that now they can avoid detection. And even when they do get caught, they can prove, you know, science can prove that you can was that hang an elephant by a daisy chain, right? Science yeah. can prove anything. And you, you've only got to mention a half credible possible reason why you failed a dope test. 
along with some well-funded lawyers and mm. you're probably going to get away with it. It's, it's disgusting. I had a conversation in a changing room after a fight and I'm not going to say who my fighter was because that would say the, the situation. But I was there with a someone from the a significant dope testing agency yeah. who I'd met before and was very intelligent, articulate and knowledgeable. And I asked this person, how often do you test a fighter or turn up on a fight night believing that they've doped, knowing that you're not going to catch them? And the answer was if we don't get a minimum of 10 to 12 weeks of testing, the chances of us catch, catching them significantly mm. reduce. And the best way for a fighter, if they're gonna dope, to avoid that is delay fight, signing the fight contract. Have an argument about complimentary tickets or hotel allotment right. or, oh, but I want Moldovan TV rights, right? Yeah, we'll do the fight. We're going to do the fight on that date, but the contract's not quite ready yet because there's this small detail to sign. Until you get five or six weeks before the fight and the fight's been announced, but yeah, yeah, you can announce it, but subject to contract. Then you sign the contract and once you sign you the contract, yeah. the doping agencies get appointed. Mm -hmm. So figure that out from the time scale. And, and once they said that, and I knew of a situation where a fight had been that the card was out. Is it, has the contract been signed yet? Has the contract been signed yet? Why has it not been signed? Oh, it's just this, it's that, it's that. Then you find, okay, well, that was signed four and a half weeks before the fight. Now it makes sense. I mean, Don Charles was talking the other day uh, before the Dubois Usyk fight, and he said that anything that anything you've profited from boxing as a result of a dope fight should be taken away from you. That will consecrate people's minds when they start having assets taken away. Derek Chisora talked about. 10 year bans because uh, you know with a strict liability are you a fan of strict liability by the way oh okay we'll come on to that you mean being responsible the the deterrence yes, i do agree the with the deterrence i agree with that because i think the whole thing needs to be cleaned up i think the whole thing needs to be a lot clearer what goes on the ban list what doesn't go on the ban list there are substances that just help you recover quicker should they be banned there are substances that make you something that you wouldn't necessarily naturally or genetically be like anabolics, yeah. absolutely, right? So, but it's because the sport doesn't have a central governing body, yeah. that is the reason why this mess can never be cleared up. Yeah, there's no cohesion or coordination in what is and what isn't banned in terms of all the territories via one but irrespective, body. But irrespective of that, isn't it the trainer and the management's job to know, irrespective, I know you're making a case for what can enhance or, or or create a problem, but if it's on a ban list, it's isn't it the professional team's job to know what's on a ban list? Do you know what the substances that people are putting in their bodies? Does everybody, but not everyone in this world lives with the same moral standards that we set for I'm ourselves. I'm not talking about morality, I'm talking about professionalism. Well, okay, oh, well, there's a difference because if yeah. you're a coach that wants your fighter to dope, to give yourself a chance of keep winning and making that money, you'll put your moral standards to the side and say, no, I'm just gonna do whatever it takes to win. There are 100% of these coaches out there and fighters out there and managers out there that encourage doping and cheating for success and the financial rewards. Is it as prolific as I've just suggested? Yes. Right. I, in my opinion, yes. Uh, is everybody around the fighter, is it possible that fighters can dope? Without anyone knowing. Without anyone else knowing? No. I so, don't think so. So then does it mean that when a fighter finds himself on the wrong side of an argument, let's say Dillian White situation and it gets proven in a recent fight, does that mean everybody goes everybody suffers the same sanctions no why not I think, well, because i think it's there because the fighter should know whoever's guilty should know who knew and who didn't yeah but you just said that it's not possible for the team around him not to know which makes them complicit okay not all the team what i'm saying is it's not possible for nobody to know someone would know whether it's the nutritionist the coach the manager a partner a friend someone would know that that person is doping, but it isn't necessarily the coach or the manager. So you do not agree, so you're not in the camp then, of uh, if everyone's in, they're all in. So if a fighter is found to have doped, that everyone around him goes down with him. To the to date. Because that would make everyone double diligent, wouldn't it? Ah, absolutely. Yeah. So, goes back then to, what's the, wh what's the risk for these fighters? Yeah, right? a couple of years sometimes. And if, they get, if that, yeah. what's the financial risk? What's the criminal risk? 
Now, we're in a sport where people die. Mm. What happens if somebody has died or critically injured, yeah. lifelong, yeah. and the person is found guilty of doping in that fight? Does that that should then become a Mass criminal order. offense? Yeah. Yeah. A criminal offense, yeah. not a ban. Forget bans. Yeah. A criminal offense. If someone knowingly dopes and makes themselves something they wouldn't ordinarily be in a combat sport environment where you know that people can be injured at best and die at worst and you cheat and it's enhanced you and that person dies, you should absolutely be criminally charged. Mm. And I pray and touch wood that that it never happen, happens to yeah. any of my fighters. Yeah. But if it were, I would do everything in my power to see if I, I could, could take it down that route. break that route. Yeah. What have you made of Conor Ben's situation? A mess. In what I mean, I think it's a mess for a lot of reasons, but my my views are well documented. It's what, just another one. It's just another one. Like it's just another one that has made me lose my faith in the system. Whether he did or didn't take a substance for me is irrelevant. It's how the process allows this. Circumnavigation. I mean, what's ambiguity? It's not even ambiguity. Is it? It's a, you can drive a bus through some of these scenarios. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, like I said, I didn't take his blood. I didn't take his piss. I didn't go to that testing lab and test it to make sure there could be no cross, cross contamination. So I can't pass my opinion on whether Conor Ben or any of these other cats are definitely guilty or not. My perspective from a coach that's got fighters to look up to me for my guidance and protection. No, they, my, all my fighters know people dope they know that they may come across someone that's doping what can i do as a coach or a manager to protect them well i'll do everything i can in terms of vada and i'll do this and i'll do that but you can never protect them the situation with the if you, you say the connor ben scenario and if you look at the chronology of it and the tests that were done and the mm. fails that were done and where he was training and what yeah. popped up on social media that he was working with this doctor who and when you go through it, it just it just all looked mm. bad. Not only did that look bad, but the way that the board of control did or didn't know and held on to that result, or the way that Matram and Wasserman and it was all dealt with mm. from someone in the business, it looked a fucking mess. That all it's done is just m made me realize that at this at this very moment in time, the only way, the only way of making this sport fair is to let everyone do whatever the hell they want. Have no have no doping control. Just say, you want to take anabolic? That can't take be anabolic. the answer, can it? But, but it's that bad that it is, yeah. you should, okay, tell well, me. Someone's going to get badly hurt then, aren't they? Absolutely. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not saying that that's what I want. What I'm saying is the only way that you can present a completely even level playing field at this moment in time is to take that stance. That's how bad it is. Now, don't get me wrong. Or increase, I, don't want it I mean, to be ultimately, there. increase the testing. I mean, ultimately, the sport's got to s s spend more money uh, supporting testing but because the people, UK doesn't yeah, have enough money. But the people that create the testing materials mm -hmm. create the masking agents. You've got poacher, and, gate, you've got poacher and gatekeeper. Mm, okay. From, my, from conversations I've had with individuals that I completely respect and see as valid. It, for me, it's not speculation. You've got poachers and... Yeah, no, I mean, I, mean, I know, room. I know. You've got Victor Conti running around telling everyone how the world should operate now, given he comes from a different position. But that is a poacher turn game. Yeah, absolutely. I get that. Yeah. I get that. What do you... Um, Chris Eubank Sr. made an observation about you, not doping, but talked about the kind of people that was around his son. And he made a specific observation about you injecting cortisone into... His son's hands. Well, I also, re I also when, when I was made aware of that, I was made aware of it at the same time when I was told that TalkSport had taken it down, taken the quote down, that it didn't appear. I've never injected anyone with anything. What he may be referring to... Because it was against Spike O'Sullivan, it was against Gary O'Sullivan. You, yeah. you are permitted to use uh, certain analogies. It's like lidocaine. You can inject lidocaine into hands. Is that a trainer's role? No, it's a physiotherapist. And it was a physiotherapist that did it. Right, so it wasn't you? No. So Chris is aware of himself on that? Wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> um, the landscape of boxing, KSI and the YouTubers, 
And obviously we've got crossovers now. We've got Francis Ngannou under Frank's jurisdiction with Bob Arum and the Saudis trying to open the door for boxing for themselves. And, and obviously Tyson fighting Francis Ngannou. W when you look at it through those misfits, YouTubers, crossover fights, is, is the sport going in the wrong direction? Is it opening up other avenues? Do you care? I'm not for or against it. If they want to do it, let them do it. What about Tyson fighting in Ghana? Put aside the... Okay, Didn't put, Muhammad Ali fight the Japanese wrestler? Yeah. Come yeah, and, yeah and Thunderlips fought Rocky Balboa. Right, but great. It's theatre. But this is a... Yeah, but do you think it's, do you think it's a bit of a joke? I mean, I, I, I personally go WBC... One of the coveted belts, WBC, ah. lineal champion of the world, hasn't fought meaningfully. Fought Derek Chisora on a charitable pension fight. Fought Dillian White, which was a legitimate fight because he was the mandatory, but it was levels in that fight. Floyd that, Mayweather, Conor, Be uh, Conor McGregor. Yeah, I hate it. I don't know, but you're. But I hate it from a point of view of you're a purist, being a purist, mm. right? But you're in it. You're. It's your. It's your business more than it is my. My, my interest and my vested interest. Tyson Fury. So he, here I'm conflicted, right? I don't think it's a credible boxing match. I think Tyson boxes his head off and I think it's yeah, a one-sided sparring session, right? <laughs> it's a one-sided sparring session. But who are we to say that Tyson Fury can't benefit from the status that he's put himself in, taking his knocks, ha taking the blows to the head, getting dropped. Inevitably, over the years, he's been a boxer. His brain has been damaged, sure. right? He's not the same man now that he would have been if he'd never boxed. He's earned the right... To capitalise on his... No, I, I get that. You use an example of Muhammad Ali fighting a Japanese yeah. wrestler. But at that point, Ali had been Ali. And, you know, he'd beaten pretty much everyone that he needed to fight. You know, whether it was Sonny Liston, whether it was Joe Frazier, whether it was George Foreman, whether it was whoever else he fought, Cleveland Williams but you're or never Jerry get Quarry. Heavy, or, you're never going to get heavyweight now or probably in future do this have the body of work yeah. of people like Muhammad Ali. Yeah. So what body of work has has Tyson Fury created enough body of professional work to allow him this money grab event? I'd say yes. Okay. I don't, I, I can't. As long as it leads and it, and it does now lead because that's what I was saying to, to Frank Warren. Fine. Okay. If we're going to indulge this money fight, please just, it's just a money fight. It's not credible. It's got no fucking credibility about it. I mean, and I don't begrudge him it, but yet, then I have to have you having your feet to the fire that he has to fight someone grown up next. And it has to be a proper fight, and it has to be, it has to be, Usyk, or it has to be something like Usyk. Well, this is your this is your own opinion to satisfy your yeah, your opinion. Of course, of yeah. Tyson Fury, and that that's yours. I agree with you. Yeah. Like, please, Tyson, you proved your point. You, you've got a hell of a journey and done whatever you've done. Yes, crack on, do this. But please, either fight Usyk or Joshua. Yeah. If you don't, all well and good, fair enough. Congratulations yeah. on everything you did. Who's next? Who can I watch now? Yeah, I I agree. Last question for you, and I, I'm, and I suppose I'm wanting to take the viewer into the corner of a ring and 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 have that moment seeing something through the eyes. Um, what's been, I suppose, the greatest thing, but the most influential thing that you've said to a fighter to change the direction of a fight, change the fortunes in a fight. The only thing I think of is when. David Hay fought Jean-Marc Mormek. Yeah, I thought you might say that. Yeah. Right. Based upon what you said earlier. And yeah. the reason why is in the build-up to that fight, we prepared for him to get knocked down. Right. And we actually looked at Costa Zhu and how Costa Zhu used to do little roly-polies backwards mm. and forwards across the ring. So what we would do in a pad work session is in Cyprus, David would go roll backwards and forwards till when he stood up, he was so dizzy, he could barely see that I was in front of him. And in that moment, I would then punch at him. He'd defend tie me up, pick me up, walk me back across the ring, set me down, step back and immediately have to be able to focus his eyes. So we kind of drilled this day's dizzy state to then not, to figure out how to get out of that state and then to then go back on the assertion, right? So that's what we did. Make yourself, And we did it a lot of sessions. Make yourself dizzy, I'm punching, tie me up, pick me up, walk me back, shut me down, sit me down, step back and now you've got to be sharp again. He gets dropped by Mormek in the fourth round. And we talked about him going down. And if you go down, look at me. Hmm. And as he looks at me, I go like this. To mean roly polies. Yeah. But if you actually look at David, he goes like, as he looks at me, he goes, as if to say, I know what you mean. 
and it was so that that's one thing that springs to mind where well, that's we'd, pretty good isn't it? we'd re <laughs> okay, I, we'd rehearsed you're gonna get you're gonna get dropped yeah. and this is how you're gonna get out of it and it played out quite nicely very good adam boover <laughs> a dislike of the same teacher <laughs> thank you for coming to see me and thank you for being so upfront with me thank you up front with me simon jordan is brought to you by william hill future episodes can be found on youtube spotify or wherever you find your podcasts 18 plus please gamble responsibly <laughs>